Well, I'm so excited. We're starting this brand new series called Different, and this will actually be a vision series. And so through this series, you're going to be hearing about some new things that, that we're going to be doing here at COTC that we're really excited about. And just to let you know that this series will be followed by a, a short relationship series that will lead us into Valentine's. We've got something very special planned for Valentine's weekend, and, and I'll be sharing more about that in coming weeks. But know this, it's going to be awesome. And uh, after that, we'll be... Um, having a series that will lead us into Easter on the Holy Spirit. So it's just a great time to, to be back at church. I hope everybody had a great uh, Christmas and New Year. And, and um, just to kind of give you a recap of uh, things that took place here this past year at, at COTC, this past summer, we sent a, a, a group of 16 to Cuba uh, on a mission trip. It was the first time we went uh, been on a mission trip to Cuba and was off the chart. We came alongside a church down there and Help them uh, do a vacation Bible school, and they had actually just purchased a house that they were turning into a to a home church, and so we were able to rewire that house and and uh, help them prepare to be able to move into that house as a church. And we did some other maintenance work. It was just an off the chart success to a point that we're going to uh, take a, another team back at the end of May. And so if you're interested in being a part of that team, January 13th will be the deadline. We already have a group of people committed, but it's not too late if you want to join uh, and be a part of that. But again, uh, January 13th is the deadline. You'll need to see Courtney. And there's just a lot of things that we have to go through with visas and, and uh, passports and being somewhat of a closed country, it's more difficult. It takes more planning to get into the country. So you need to jump on board if you're interested in that. This past year, we saw 41 baptisms and 56 new members here at Church of the Cross. And um, through our recovery ministry here at Church of the Cross, we saw 46 salvations, six alone, just New Year's uh, Eve. Hey, you know what? We could give God a big shout out for that. Amen. <clears throat> Last year, through our food pantry, uh, we gave out 116,000 pounds of food, and, and uh, we actually uh, have the availability of to be able to receive more food. Right now, we're in the middle of trying to solve a storage uh, issue, which is a good problem to have, so be praying for us on that end. But we serve anywhere between 140 to 150 uh, needy families twice a month that come to Church of the Cross and get their needs met. In addition, on, on any given Friday, we are sending 35 to 50 backpacks down to Bayshore Elementary School to give the kids that have been identified as at-risk kids, kids that may go hungry over the weekend. And I just want to say this, be, I, just, I can't say this is enough, because of you guys being radically generous, we are able to, to make sure kids are not going hungry in our, in our backyard. And again, I just want to say thank you guys for that. We also now have a serve team that every week they're going out and they're ministering to the homeless, they're praying for the homeless, they're, they're providing food and clothing for that. And this past Easter, uh, actually Palm Sunday, we had our first community-wide um, worship service where we put on a free barbecue Easter egg hunt and invited our, our neighbors to come join us for a service and then have lunch on us. And we had hundreds that came out from our neighborhood. And now we have some, <clears throat> some people that are now a part of us at Church of the Cross because of that effort. And then this past candy festival was the, the biggest and uh, greatest that we've had yet. We've had, we had thousands of people on our property. And the cool thing for me is not so much the numbers, but what I look at is our prayer booths. We had people throughout the night from our community being prayed for by, by people here at Church of the Cross. Again, that was a beautiful thing. And again, we saw families come into our church because of the efforts uh, of what you guys have done in that area. And I don't know if you know, but our, um, our uh, youth ministry continues to adopt Bayshore High School uh, football team. So before every football game, they come and they fill up our Oasis uh, room with football players, coaches, and assistants. We give them a, a wonderful dinner and then provide them with the devotion. And just one of the things as we are moving into 2019 that as an older board that we've chose to, to do, to make a greater difference, to, to widen our, our realm of influence, we joined a, a group called ARC, and that's the Association of Related Churches. 
An ark is made up of pastors and churches and leaders with a heart and vision to see healthy and thriving churches in every community. And they do that through building strong relationships and sharing resources. And I've, uh, I've actually been with a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm networked with a group of uh, ARC pastors, and I have been for about a year just in accountability and just doing life together with. And um, we want to be a part of that because what they're doing is they're doing it so well in, in what they're doing as far as planting churches. Last year alone, they planted 80 churches. And so, so from now on, when you give, just know part of your giving, not only going to help further the kingdom of God in our community, but it's helping plant churches around the world. And actually, starting next week, we're going to be doing something a little different. When we find out of a new church that's being planted through our, we'll be praying for them. But in the, in the weeks in between, we'll be praying for our missionaries and local churches as well. So we're just excited about this coming year. And you know, New Year always has the idea of a fresh start and, and doing things differently. I don't know if you heard about the guy that, that read a book over the Christmas holidays called Be the Man in Your House. And so he's ready to go back to work after the Christmas holiday, so he walks into the kitchen and next morning where his wife is sitting there at the kitchen table having her morning coffee, coffee as usual. So he walks over to the table and throws the book down in front of her. And he looks at her and says, things are going to be different from here on out because I am the man of the house. <clears throat> he says, when I come home tonight, I expect a hot dinner on the, on the table waiting for me. And after dinner, I expect you to bring me my favorite dessert. After I eat dessert, after I eat my dinner, I'm going to go take a shower. I'm going to go hang out with the bros down at the pool hall. And then he looks at her with a stern fo- <clears throat> voice and says, now who do you think is going to dress me and comb my hair tomorrow morning? And she looks at him with not even a hesitation and says, the funeral director. Boom, huh? So. I felt the blood pressure from you ladies as I'm telling the joke go up. And I just, it was just a joke. I could just feel it. It's like, where's he going with this? So, all seriousness, hey, you know, as we new, look at New Year, it's an opportunity for a fresh start. And maybe things will be better this year. Maybe things will be different this year. And in this series, we, we want to help you to think different so that you can be different and so that you can go on and make a difference with your life. And what we're going to do over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the Bible and see how God is calling us as followers of Jesus Christ to live a different life. And let's just bow our heads and pray right now. Father, we just ask you, God, as we take these next few weeks of of really embarking on living a different life. I pray, Lord, that you would teach us, that you would help us to live that life that pleases you, that live that life that will make a difference. Live the life of freedom that you have for us and joy that you have for us. And so I just pray, Father, your Holy Spirit would just teach us this morning. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. Well, first Peter says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So God's telling us that, that he's doing something inside of a people that might not have had a, a family. Maybe they're coming from a dysfunctional family, but now they've been given a family, and it's not an ordinary family. How many of you are, are glad to be a part of God's family? How many of you guys are <clears throat> glad to be a part of COTC? I just want to tell you, I'm so proud of you guys. I've heard story after story over the Christmas holiday of small groups and, and people uh, <clears throat> individually that that you were led by the Holy Spirit to come alongside somebody that was struggling during, during the ho- holiday. And I just want to say thank you. That's a beautiful picture of the body of Christ functioning as a family. Let me ask you, how many of you want, once were a people with no mercy, but now you are overwhelmed with the mercy and grace of God? I want to tell you, folks, that's me, okay? And I never want to forget the mercy and goodness that God has extended to me. You know, about every other week, uh, every other week, every other year, I go back to uh, Cleveland and, and hang out with some good friends up there and everything. And, um, 
Every single time I go back, my, the, the one friend I stay with, he lives out in the suburbs in a really nice community, nice house and everything. And um, never fail, I'll go. I said, hey, Mike, man, let me use your car. I said, you're going back to the old neighborhood, aren't you? And I said, yeah, man. And he never really wants to go with me. So I'll take his car. And my neighborhood I grew up in growing up was bad, but it's really bad now. And so I just take the car and I just drive through the streets. Sometimes I'll park the car and think. Sometimes I'll park the car and get out and walk. I never want to forget where I came from. I never want to forget how far God has brought me. And I want to encourage you today, not that we're getting stuck in a past or not, never forget the goodness and mercy that God has extended towards you. And sometimes we may wonder, am I doing enough good things to get to heaven? The good news, it has nothing to do with what we do. It has everything to do with what Christ has done for us. Amen? And Jesus had done all the work. And when we really begin to understand how the, the goodness and grace and mercy impacts our life, and we really connect the dots of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. We'll quit trying to earn our way into heaven, and all of a sudden you, you come to terms with, you know what, I can be a different kind of person because of the grace and the goodness of God. And God's will for every single one of us here this morning is to live a different life from what the world has to offer us. And Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's a quote I came across. You may want to write it. I should have put it in your notes. had a senior moment, but you might want to write this down. God wants us to live a life in such a way that it demands an explanation. I want to read that again. God wants us to live a life in such a way that it demands an explanation. We're living our lives in such a way. We're spending our money in such a way. We're raising our families in such a way. We're giving in such a way. We're serving in such a way that when people look at your life, they notice the difference in your life. They ask themselves, why do they live like that? Why do they serve like that? Why do they give like that? How could they go through that illness like that? How could they go through that pain and loss like that? Why did they respond like that? God is calling us to be a different kind of people, to live a life in such a way that demands an explanation. Now, here's the bottom line. To be different, we need to think different. And the Bible tells us, do not be conformed. In other words, you can be a follower of Christ, and if you don't deal with your thought life, if you don't learn to take your thoughts captive, you can live a life that's no different than people that are living a life without God. And if we're not careful, we can live in all the fear and all the negativity that is consuming our culture today. But here's the beautiful thing. We don't have to. The good news is because of God's mercy, because of his goodness, because of the goodness and greatness of God, we can renew our minds. And that means we can control our thoughts that that leads to actions. And we are able to examine our thoughts and say, you know what, this is not a healthy thought. I'm going to reject that. You know, this is not a good thought. I'm going to reject that. We can control our thoughts. Now, this may be a whole new concept to you as far as taking control of your thoughts and and being able to deal with that. And if that's you, I understand that. But I promise you, if you'll hang with me in this series, I promise you it will change your life. Because here's the bottom line. The way you think affects the way that you feel. The way that you feel affects the way that you act. Okay? So if you want to change something... You don't necessarily start with the actions. You don't start with the feelings. You start with your thoughts because your thoughts affect your feelings and your feelings lead to action. And I'm telling you, there are lies that we have picked up along the way in life that can beat us down and hold us back if they're not exposed and dealt with. Trust me, I am a walking example of that, okay? And we're going to be talking more about this throughout this series. And, you know, we don't read the Bible to try to earn uh, brownie points with God. You know, sometimes people read the Bible like some, some type of religious duty and, hey, I'm good with God today. I've read the Bible. Him and I are good. 
We don't read the Bible to get on God's good side. We read the Bible to get his light into our lives. We read the Bible to get his truth into our heart, to show us how we're to live our life. And when you get a hold of God and you begin to, to seek him through his word, I want to tell you, it opens up a whole new world to you. Because all of a sudden, you begin to see that, you know what, I don't have to be a victim. I don't have to be stuck in my past. You know what, I can be free from this habit. I can be free from this addiction. And when you change your thinking, you change your life. And when you think differently, I'm telling you, you live differently. I want us to look at some guys in the New Testament that had to learn to to think differently, and that's the disciples. And and a lot of times we put put Bible characters on these pedestals, and a lot of times we'll put the um, the disciples on the pedestal. And I grew up in the Orthodox Church, which is a lot like the Catholic Church. When you walk into the sanctuary, man, they just have all these beautiful religious paintings all over, just throughout the sanctuary, and they're called icons. And in these paintings, the disciples always look so darn holy, okay? They're glowing and and have like little halos on them. Can I tell you something? These guys are normal guys. They're normal Joes just like you and I, okay? They have the same struggles. They have the same temptation that you and I faced. And in the story that we're going to look at, we're going to look at a story where they had to learn to think differently if they're going to be different. And let's read Mark. Mark 4, 35 through 41 says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in a boat as he, <clears throat> as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, Do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now their thoughts are way off, and you may ask, How do you know their thoughts are way off? Because their actions are way off, okay? And the disciples got three things wrong here, okay? They had wrong thinking. Number one, about Jesus' words. They thought wrong about Jesus' words. Jesus said, hey, we're going to the other side. Notice he didn't say, hey, we're going to go to the middle lake, we're going to sink the boat, and we're all going to drown. No, he said, we're going to the other side. Now, we have grown so accustomed to words having little meaning in, in, in our culture. Have you noticed that? We expect politicians to lie to us. We just expect that. The thing that bugs me to no degree, we reelect them knowing that they're going to lie to us, but that's another story. I'm not going to go there. Be disciplined, Stan. Take thoughts of, take captive those thoughts, okay? We don't, we expect, we don't trust the news media. Okay, we don't trust the news media. I see their lips moving, but, you know, I don't believe a word that comes out of their mouth. I'm just being honest with you. But Jesus tells us this. We are going to be judged for every idle word that we have spoken. And idle means non-productive word. Jesus did not have any non-productive word. In fact, he said, I only say what the Father says. I only do what I see the Father doing. So he said, hey, we're going to the other side. That's all they needed to focus on. Jesus said it. Hey, it's going to happen. But here's the deal. They didn't think his words were true. They did not think his words were powerful. Now, here's the second thing that they got wrong with their thinking. That's Jesus' care for them. They thought Jesus didn't care about them. It's so easy in the middle of a negative situation to let fear cloud our thinking. And their thinking got blurred because Jesus is sleeping in a boat and all, all the waves are crashing around and probably lightning's popping around them. <clears throat> and they're just thinking God doesn't care about them. And this is so huge. This is a message in itself. But we need to remember if Jesus can sleep in the middle of a storm, 
I want to encourage you today, you can sleep in the middle of the storm. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, that means Jesus reigns and lives within you. You follow what I'm saying? That means he's got it under control. He's going to see you through that storm. He's either going to calm it down, he's going to see you through it. But if Jesus can relax in it, you can relax in it because Jesus is with you. Okay, now I'm going to try to pull it back to where I'm at. Okay, so Jesus is in the back of the boat. He's sleeping in the middle of the storm. You could just almost picture the disciples, man, kind of murmuring to one another, complaining to one another. Man, we're all going to die. Where's Jesus at? He's sleeping on a job over here. And then they may be having an argument back and forth. Hey, you wake him up. I'm not going to wake him up. You wake him up. I'm not going to wake him up. You wake him up. And they're saying, you know what? He doesn't even care about us. And when they wake up, that's exactly what they they say to him. Don't you even care about us? Don't you care that we're about to die? And when they wake up, Jesus, notice that Jesus didn't panic. Notice he didn't get up. Oh, my gosh, you guys should have woke me up earlier. This is horrible. Jesus didn't panic. He just got up. He calmed the storm down. And the disciples had completely misjudged his care for them. They misjudged, man, the storm's going on, so this must mean that Jesus doesn't care about us. See, they could have focused on the fact that everywhere that Jesus went, he took care of them. Everywhere that Jesus went, he brought a solution to the problem at hand. Jesus was good to these guys. But what happened is they let fear creep in, and they panicked. Here's the third thing that they wrong thinking they had, had wrong thinking about Jesus' power. They missed how powerful Jesus was. They they thought that he was just a great teacher or a great prophet. They didn't connect the dots that he was truly the son of God. So when the son of God stands up, things are going to happen. You follow what I'm saying? Things are going to take place. And they totally forgot all the miracles that they had witnessed, all the signs and wonders he performed. And again, they haven't connected the dots that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's all-powerful. That's why after Jesus calms the storm down, if you look at the story, they didn't break out in worships and say, thank you, we are with Jesus, the Son of God, the all-powerful one. What did they do? They looked at each other and said, who can this be that he can calm a storm down? They didn't realize who he was. They didn't realize how powerful that he was all-powerful. Now, to their credit, they stayed with Jesus, and Jesus helped them to realign their thinking, have right thinking, so that they could turn around and be different and make a difference. So what are some of the areas that we need to make sure that we're thinking correctly about? Well, here's number one, God's care for you. Now, this might be a challenge for some people, because sometimes people think when when they're going through a problem, that means God doesn't care about them. I heard somebody say, again, I should have put this in your notes. You might want to write this down. This is a quote. It says, the presence of a problem does not mean the absence of God's care. I want to read that again. The presence of a problem does not mean the absence of God's care. Jesus told us in this life we're going to have tribulation. We live in a world that we have a real spiritual enemy, named Satan and a host of demons that hates your guts. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, he absolutely hates your guts. We live in a world that's fallen because of sin, and we live in a world filled with crazy people. Do not look to that person to your left or right. Keep focused on me, okay? But Jesus says we're going to have tribulation in this life. But what does he say also? He said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome this world. And we need to remind ourselves of the end game, that we're just passing through this life. Okay, we have heaven waiting for it. That's absolutely perfect. There's not a spiritual enemy always trying to to take us out, and there's no crazy people around us. Heaven is our final destination, and we need to keep our, our focus on that. And when fear, uh, when we feel forgotten, when we feel abandoned, that's when we need to push past those feelings and remind ourselves that, you know what, God does care for me. And this, this suffering is only temporary. First Peter says this, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I will tell you, that's a great verse to memorize because that's a promise to each and every one of us here this morning. 
Notice that it doesn't say humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so he could crush us. It doesn't say that. It says that we are to humble ourselves. Why? So he could exalt us. He wants to exalt means to elevate. He wants to elevate you above your problems. He wants to elevate you above those negative circumstances. God's mighty hand can do mighty things. And it tell, tells us that we need to cast all our cares upon him. That means all those worries, all of those things that weigh heavy on your heart, that's burdening you down, that's causing you to lose sleep, causing you to be depressed. God wants us to cast those cares upon him. And I promise you, if you'll learn to do that, it'll make all the difference in, in your life. You'll be a different person. Why? Because all of a sudden, you recognize, you know what? God is with me. God's got this. God goes before me. God's close to me. God's going to see me through it. All of a sudden, your, your perspective is going to be changed. Things are going to be different in your life. And remember, the presence of a problem does not mean the absence of God's care in your life. Here's the second thing is we need to think differently about God's power in your life. God is bigger and more powerful than any problem in your life. Okay, he's wiser than any complicated circumstance that's troubling you. And when we begin to understand that, again, it's going to make a difference in our life. And not only are we going to be looking outside for God to move in our circumstances, but we need to be reminded that he's given us his Holy Spirit to live within us. And the Holy Spirit is a source of strength. The Holy Spirit is a source of power in our life. And 2 Timothy tells us this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And again, we'll be talking more about uh, the Holy Spirit in a, in a new series that we have coming up. But know this, we don't have a weak, timid spirit within us. We have a strong, powerful helper within us. And if we begin to think along those lines, I'm telling you, it's going to make a difference in your life. So this week, when, when you face that difficulty that you can't find a way out, I want to encourage you to pause for a moment to step back and remind yourself that if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God also gave you a helper, and that's the Holy Spirit. Remind yourself, step back, and you just pray under your breath, Holy Spirit, give me guidance here. Give me wisdom. Give me courage. Help me to navigate through this because his job is to help you to come alongside you. Now, what we need to do is to take a moment and ask for his help and listen. Okay, are you guys with me this morning? Okay, here's number three. We need to think differently about God's word. God's word is personal. God's word is powerful. And 1 Thessalonians says this, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. God is, God's word is more powerful than any philosopher, than any religion, than any communist regime, the enemy has been trying to wipe out the word of God since the beginning of time. And it can't be done. Why? Because it's a living word. It's a living document. The word of God is eternal. And it's more powerful than any problem that you and I are faced with. I want to give you a powerful example uh, of the power of God working through somebody that actually used to attend here. Bob Ferrier, he was an elder for many, many years here. Uh, he's gone on to be with the Lord a few years ago. He was also, I really considered him as really a, a spiritual father to me. Him and his wife took Karen and I under uh, their wings when we first started attending here at Church of the Cross. So um, I just really, you know, I just honor them and, and just hold them in high regard. But Bob was a, a World War II veteran. He was a decorated uh, war hero. He was wounded in the war. He told me story after story of his experiences in war. He actually could have had a, a movie uh, about his uh, experiences in the war. How many of y'all saw the movie Saving Private Ryan? Anybody see that? It is the most graphic, realistic movie about World War II that's ever been made. And um, I took him to see it. I took him out for dinner one night. I took him to see it. 
And um, if you were there, at least when I was there, okay, when I viewed it, after the movie, and the movie was over, there was this sober silence. Nobody moved. After the movie, most people are trying to get out. There was like this hush of reverence at the end. I, I, mean, I still remember personally I'm just going through all these emotions of really having such a gratefulness and appreciation for those that have laid down their lives and, and purchased our freedom. I had an emotion of, man, I wish my dad was alive who, who, who served in World War II. I'm thinking, man, I never told my dad thank you for what he did for me. And so I, I was really dealing with my emotions. So finally I got a hold of my emotions. I looked over at Bob and I said, Bob, was it really about as bad as it is? Because it's all about the um, invasion, Normandy, uh, uh, invading the beaches in Normandy. He was a part of that. I said, was it really that bad? And I'll never forget, he didn't miss a beat. He looked at me and said, oh, it was a lot worse. I said, a lot worse? He said, yeah, the smell. I said, what do you mean the smell? I said, man, when we hit the beaches, man, he said, I just remember the smell of burning flesh and diesel mixed together. And he told me how that when he got back to the States, that he couldn't sleep at night. He'd be tormented with these horrible dreams about the war. And he'd be driving down the street, and he'd smell diesel, and that'd just trigger him to have these flashbacks of the war. And we all know that it's a post-traumatic uh, uh, stress disorder. But nobody knew that. Nobody knew how to treat that back then. But that's what he was going through. And he was crying out to God because he just said, man, I was going to go crazy if I didn't deal with this, if God didn't do a miracle in my life, and he was a believer and just started seeking God, he began to literally sleep with the word of God under his pillow. He began to memorize scripture, and he spent time every single day reading the word of God. And before long, guess what? He was totally set free from those tormenting dreams he was totally set free from having flashbacks. Folks, this would be a good time to give God a shout out right now. I mean, it's powerful, man. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Can the scriptures bring stability into your life? Absolutely. Can the scriptures make you strong? Absolutely. Can the scriptures help you overcome the negative things that have happened in your life? Absolutely. And we need to get tired about talking about our problem, and we need to focus on the answer, and the answer is Jesus and his word. And the word of God is powerful and personal. That's why I keep encouraging people to develop that habit of reading the Bible every day. And I want to challenge you, as we go into this new year, make a commitment to begin to read your Bible on a daily basis. And you may say, be sitting there and say, Stan, when are you going to get off the bandwagon of reading the Bible every single day? Man, it, I won't get off that bandwagon until I die, okay? Because I know the difference that, that it makes. And I want to encourage you to, uh, to hook up with a Bible app called YouVersion. They have tons of different type of reading programs. Just get involved in one. Make it a priority to read the Bible on a daily basis. Before you do anything, spend time with God. Now, I say this every single time because it's so important. When you make that commitment, know this. You're going to miss a couple days due to illness or vacation, and then you have the enemy come whispering in your ear, saying what a failure you are, you need to just quit, you need to push past that, and tell that voice to shut up, and you just pick up where you left back off at, okay? You just keep pressing in. God's word is powerful, and it's personal, and when you begin to think of it that way, it begins to make a difference in your life. It brings clarity, it brings freedom, it can bring life, it will make you different. I also want to invite you, along with committing to reading the Word of God every day, annually here at Church of the Cross, we join a lot of churches across uh, our country that sets aside 21 days in January to fast and pray. And that's a spiritual discipline that we encourage you to take to bring clarity and revelation in your life. And fasting doesn't necessarily mean food. Some people fast TV, social media, activities that they enjoy. It's not so much what you fast. It's about opening your heart, making a sacrifice before God. 
And some people think that if they're fasting food, it's about punishing your body. It couldn't be further from the truth. It's really about getting rid of the distraction in your life. And there's a host of different fasts, and we have some websites that you can go to uh, in, in your notes. But, you know, there's the Daniel fast where you only eat vegetables and, and fruit. There's juice fast, fast. Again, you could do social media. You could do TV. Mix it up. Take, you know, take a week and fast social media. Take another week and do something else. Just do it. I just want to encourage you to step in and do it and expect God to meet you. And again, I also want to tell you, just like with reading the Bible, maybe we, we mess up. And maybe in a moment of weakness, you eat, some, you eat a box of Krispy Kreme donuts, okay? You know what? If you do that, you just get back up and say, God, give me strength. Forgive me. Give me strength. I want to honor you, God. And you just pick up where you left off. And here's what we're doing. When we're denying ourselves physical food or saying no to a particular activity, something happens inside of us that's different. It's, it's hard to explain. But as your body physically becomes weaker, your spiritual, spiritual man becomes more in tune with God. As you begin to say no to certain activities or things and lean into God, your life begins to change and you become different. Because what you're doing and really what you're saying is, I want more of God in my life this year. I want to reflect your power and your love, God. I want that reflecting in my life as I go, go through this next year. I want everything that you have for me, God, in 2019. And when you do that, I'm just telling you, you'll be different. A year from now, when somebody asks you, hey, how'd you do spiritually in 2019? You can say, you know what? I experienced God in a deep and profound way. I'm a different person than I was a year ago. I also want to uh, let you know that we made available through our app and through our website a devotional called Awakening, 21 Days of Fasting and Praying. It's the same one we used last year. I actually spent time just looking for, through different devotionals, and this is absolutely the best. And so I just want to encourage you, as you start that fast, which starts tomorrow, read that devotional that goes along with it. And just be a, a powerful um, way to enhance that uh, fast that you're taking. But I just want to encourage you to step into that this year and expect God to do great things in your heart and, and just expect him. He wants you to. And as you, I promise you, the Bible says as we draw closer to God, he will draw closer to us. Amen? Amen. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this time together. And I do pray, Father, for each and every one of us here today. God, that, that we would go into two, 2019 with just a heart after you. God, that we would let the old things of, of the past just peel off of us, God. God, that we would be able to receive forgiveness from you for our sins and, and for our hang-ups, and we'd, we would be able to forgive ourselves and just go after you with our whole heart, Father. And I, I do pray, Father, that you would help us to think differently this year about your love and your care for us, about your power. God, that you are all powerful, God. I pray, God, that we look, think differently about your word, that we would see your word as life, as hope for us, and we wouldn't neglect spending time with you on a daily basis. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but if that's you today, I just want to encourage you, just simply pray that prayer between you and God. God, today, I want to be that different person that I'm hearing about today. I want to experience your joy. I want to experience your love. I want to experience your forgiveness. And God, I recognize that that starts with humbling myself before you. And right now, I do that. I ask you right now, Father, forgive me for all my sins, for all the wrong things I've done. I ask you that you just remove my sin, remove all the negativity in my life, and replace it with your spirit, with your love, with your joy, with your peace, with your mercy. I pray for all of us here, every family represented here today. I just pray a blessing upon them. I pray, Father, that you would meet everybody's um, physical, spiritual, and emotional need. And I do pray, God, that you would create in each one of us just a hunger for more of you 
this year. And we thank you and we pray these in the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. amen.